Okay. So, uh, my name is Tommy Palm. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of uh, Resolution Games. Uh, always very happy to be back in Helsinki again. Been here uh, working quite a lot with Nokia back in the days. Um, this was announced as the Google keynote. Uh, Google Daydream keynote. Um, I just want a small disclaimer that I can't speak on, on Google's behalf. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about Daydream a little bit, but this is mostly about mobile VR in general and some of the advice that I've uh, kind of gotten from, from working with that now for a bit. I'll stand over here so you can all see me. <clears throat> All right. I grew up in the 80s, uh, and I played a lot of video games uh, on my Commodore 64. And one of my favorite games was this Bruce Lee. It's a kind of a platform beat 'em up game. Can I see a raise of hand? How many of you actually played this game? All right. As, this is a, a great, very accessible take on multiplayer. You could play with a friend, and a friend could join us. One of the um, like little ninjas or, or Yamu, the, the green guy. It was very easy for them to drop in and out. And one of the things that really fascinated me about video games already back then is, well, if it's already this cool, imagine what's going to be in, in a couple of years from now. And like the 10-year-old version of me would have been blown away if, if I could show them somehow how Battlefield 1 or any of these modern games look like. Um, I decided to leave my well-paid job at King uh, when, in November 2014, I saw the Samsung Gear VR headset. And I, I realized that this is a phone that can already provide a really great user experience in terms of, of uh, VR. And I will talk about, uh, draw some parallels about the early days of mobile uh, game development and that industry. I've studied Resolution is my fifth startup, and I've been in, in mobile games for a long time, and uh, I definitely see some parallels. Uh, VR is certainly not a hit platform yet, uh, and there is a lot of interest for, for VR, so I'll talk a little bit about why and if that's justified. And uh, these are the three main topics. So, so I'll speak about uh, design and also about Daydream, of course. All right, so uh, if you look at what VR really is, it's, it's about trying to, to uh, trick the brain into thinking that this uh, world is, is the new reality. And if any one of you have worked on, on a 3D game engine, you know that there's an insane amount of calculations running in the background in order to, to do this. Uh, and in VR, it's much worse because you're doing it twice, and you're rendering about 170% of every scene for both eyes. And you need to do it at a speed at least uh, f uh, 60 times per, per second. So that's extremely demanding, obviously, for, for the hardware under it. But as a game developer, you really don't have to care that much about it. As long as you come up and, and you run at, at this performance rate, uh, you don't have to think about what is actually going on in the background. Uh, our interface to the world is uh, based on these five senses, uh, obviously. It's visual, hearing, uh, smell, taste, and touch. And when it comes to the first two ones, visual and, and uh, audio, we are pretty close to trick the brain into believing that we're actually being teleported somewhere else. I would say we're about 80% there of giving you a complete, uh, tricking you that you're there. And it's very obviously if you go into a horror experience in VR that your brain is reacting strongly, that this is very, very credible. Um, Smell and, and uh, taste are not so super important for games. Um, so there is, there is uh, research going on there, but it's not one of the more important ones. The most important ones is touch, obviously. If you can reach out and feel the texture of surface uh, and then feel the, the resistance of virtual objects, that would be great. And that's something that we see a lot when we try game experience on, uh, on new users. The first things that come out is their hand. I took this picture on E3. Uh, one guy was trying a VR game. It wasn't my game. Um, and you typically see people trying to, to use their hands to interact with things. 
Um, 2016 is the first year where we have consumer uh, hardware out. And I, I took this slide. Uh, you're familiar with a lot of this. On the left-hand side, you have the, the mobile handsets uh, as cardboard and uh, uh, Samsung Gear VR and uh, schematics of, of the Daydream. Uh, headset. In the top, we have HTC Vive, which is a little bit different because you have room scale. You're actually walking around in, in the, the world. And we have Rift and Sony uh, coming out later. Um, one of the big obstacles for VR right now is the, is the actual input. People, uh, the optimal thing would be to use your hand. We are not quite there yet. There is a lot of experimentation going on around that. Uh, the Oculus controllers are one of the um, best ways of, of actually using your hands once you learn how to use them. They're, they're very, very smooth. They will come out uh, later this year. Uh, a gamepad is used quite a lot for, for controlling VR, which is, I've never been a big fan of, of that uh, control mechanism at all. Because it's very abstract and it, uh, one of the great things with smartphone games is that you have this direct control where you're manipulating the items, and you would see that that opens up for a lot more people other than than hardcore audience. So, just comparing a little bit what we have on the PC or console side right now, we have the cord, and we have a lot more power. I would say about 200 times more uh, graphic processing power in, in general. We have kind of an old school audience there a little bit that are uh, more hardcore gamers. They have expectation on what their VR experience is going to be like. They want to play Skyrim where you can interact with everything, you can, somebody shoots an arrow at you, they pick it up and shoot it right back. That is not going to happen just yet. We'll, we'll come there eventually, but we're not there yet. Uh, so we'll see a little bit of backlash, I think, when, when we're seeing this platform rolls out and we can't have the games that people were hoping to, to get right now. On the PC side, we have Positioning, absolute positioning. So you can lean in and look closer to things. You can't do that on any of the mobile uh, devices yet, and that's definitely a big difference. It, it helps a lot if you can if you can move your hand around and get absolute positioning for for your hands. And on the mobile side, on the other hand, we have a very attractive price point because you probably got your smartphone for multiple reasons, not only for gaming. Uh, and it's a very portable thing, so it's easy to bring with you and demo it. Uh, it's it's uh, really painful to try to demo something that you've done for the Vive at this point. If you bring it to a show, you need a lot of room to, to set it up. Um, so I, I believe that mobile VR has definitely a much more um, better potential of reaching mass market uh, quite soon. And also it's a multi-purpose device. So if your Xbox One breaks down, and you're an adult and you have a family and you have a lot of things to do, you're less likely to instantly go to the store and, and to try to get it repaired. Whereas if your phone breaks, the day after you'll make sure that you have some way of, of communicating. So uh, these multipurpose devices are, are really handy for that um, reason. Uh, Mobile VR is very different from mobile games in general in the fact that it's, it's not a casual experience. It's not something you, you have on the bus and you'll pick up and play a little bit as you're commuting to work. This is a great example from one of my, to my friends, uh, Paul, who was trying uh, our game, and my other friend, Kieran, who was instantly messing with him as he was trying to do it. So you typically play more in the where you would play console experience. It's competing with the time where you're watching movies or, or video, you're mostly home in your sofa. Um, so won't replace the smartphone um, just yet. Um, two things that VR is great for is, is presence, this feeling of being teleported somewhere, and the other thing is focus. Uh, this is a scene from The Matrix when Neo has weapon training, and the, as the real world disappears, you get a lot of more time that you can focus on something that's in the VR world. And I think this is something that's great for education and has the potential to really uh, be uh, meaningful for, for those things. When you want to learn something, it's great to be uh, in, a, in an interesting format, and VR definitely has a lot of potential there. 
VR is very isolating at this point. That's one of the comments we often get when we do user testing, especially on, on uh, non-hardcore female uh, testers. They, they go from being together with a lot of other people, and you put this on, and you put the headsets on, and all of a sudden you're alone, and you're not anymore in a social setting. That can be a handicap, but it can also be a very powerful thing if you, uh, if you use it correctly. It's, since you have this feeling of presence, being together with somebody else is, is really, really strong. I don't know how many of you have tried the Oculus uh, toy box demo as a social experience, but that's extremely convincing how interesting it is to be in a virtual world and just play around with a friend. Uh, I personally think that the MMO uh, genre is finally going to come back, where you have this persistent world where you can hang out with friends. It's, it's kind of had a slope for a while, but, but it's, this is a great uh, opportunity for it. So just show briefly into a couple of VR design tricks that we picked up on the way working with this. Uh, one thing that is obvious, but it can't be repeated enough, don't move the camera around. Uh, it should be kind of dedicated for, for head movements for the user. Um, you very easily become uh, cyber sick when, when you're uh, being moved around. I've, I've uh, been a judge in a few game competitions, and uh, once you get a game that is shaking you around, you're nauseous for, for hours, and it's very um, painful. Dark scenes tend to be much more convincing than bright scenes, and better in general. If you have, if you have a phone, you uh, very often have a heating issue that you as a developer need to take into consideration. The phone heats up if you're using all its uh, processing power. Uh, so darker scenes are also better in the sense that they are not uh, consuming as much energy. Um, sounds are very important for this feeling of, of presence. So if you're demoing uh, the games, make sure that people are, are using headphones because it, it does make a big difference. Uh, and characters have a deep, uh, something special happens if you have a well-implemented character on this platform. You form an emotional bond to it that you don't do on other platforms. Um, just briefly on this kind of design dilemma that it's very easy to design for the swivel share, uh, but it's not a very likely user scenario. You're much more likely going to be in a sofa or something where you can turn around and play seamlessly behind you. So it's better to design for a, a 120 uh, degree and make sure that you have the content in front of you. Even though you want to have something back, because sometimes people turn back just to see, but you typically don't want the gameplay to go on behind the, the characters. All right, so more about Daydream. Daydream were, uh, was announced uh, earlier this year on Google I.O. And uh, Resolution Games was included on a slide about uh, launch partners. So we were very happy to see our company side by side with, with other companies like uh, Electronic Arts and Ubisoft. Uh, it's an open platform uh, that is not dependent on the single hardware manufacturer uh, as the Samsung Gear. The Samsung Gear VR is, is a fantastic uh, platform for, from a developer point of view, but it's limited to only people who are having Samsung devices. Whereas the Daydream uh, platform is an, is an open specification, so uh, if your Android phone uh, are following the specs, then you'll be able to, to uh, utilize this uh, VR platform, much like the cardboard is. And it's uh, launching later this year. Uh, it also has a controller that allows you to, to manipulate things in the 3D um, space. Uh, and that's one of the things that also have been uh, one of the bottlenecks a little bit with Samsung Gear, where you had a touchpad, which is a way of controlling, but it's definitely one of the more limiting things about, about that platform. Uh, this new controller for the Daydream will work similar to a, a Wiimote. So if you imagine holding a, a phone in your hand and getting input from accelerator and gyro, that's pretty much what it, what it's going to, uh, how it's going to work. And 
Um, we announced that we are working on an amusement park game. Um, it has zero roller coasters in it because of this uh, vection problem. I think roller coasters is one of the kind of worst demos of, of uh, the powers of VR. I, I still see it a lot. Uh, but this title, Wonderglade, is a kind of non-violent, easy, accessible game uh, where we try to maximize uh, the new exciting uh, things on, on the VR platform. And uh, we've worked with it for a bit now, and, and we're uh, truly excited about uh, to see the launch and what, what it will bring. One of the great things is that uh, this already has uh, a website support. You, any developer can download everything you need in order to develop content for this. Uh, and uh, you can make your own emulator if you have uh, two uh, phones. According to, to this, Google has always been very great at supporting developers. So uh, if you want to be there at launch, there's still an opportunity for, for that. So just mention a few common pitfalls. Uh, I, I personally feel very much that bad VR apps is like rotten food. Your brain will help you to remember uh, how you got into that situation, and you reluctantly you will be very reluctant in, in doing it again. Uh, so stay away from, from cyber sickness. One thing that seems to be becoming standardized is that you use this teleportation method for, for moving around. If you want the player to move and you still want the first person view, uh, where you, uh, this is from budget cuts scene, where you, you hold up something and you click and you come to this other area that you are targeting. And performance is super important. You need to keep up the 60 frames per second for your game. It's, it's vital, otherwise you, you'll induce nausea, and that's not good. Um, so a quick look behind the scenes on, on our bait game. This is the fishing game we released earlier this year. We announced that we had uh, 700,000 downloads of it uh, already for, for Samsung Gear VR. So pretty big numbers uh, for being so early in the market. Um, we typically have about 50,000 uh, polygons uh, and up to maximum of 50 draw calls. Uh, what that means is that it's much easier to do uh, indoor scenes than outdoor. But obviously, if you want to do fishing, you, it's much better to, to be outside. Um, so I thought we'd kind of look briefly on, on behind the scenes how we did this. Um, so this is what that scene looks like from above. We're using Unity, some of you might see. And we typically uh, put a lot of these polygons very close to the user on the objects that are there. So we have uh, trees and parrots and fishing equipment near you. And, and uh, then as we go away, we cheat more and more. And if you zoom out even more, you'll see that this is, uh, since the player is standing still, uh, you, you can cheat quite a lot on, on where you add objects and where you put your resources. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of great performance trick on, on the Oculus uh, development blog. Uh, smart people like John Carmack is thinking a lot about how to optimize for mobile VR. And uh, we definitely picked up a lot of things there. Uh, as I said before, 2016 is, is kind of year one for, for VR, as we're seeing the first generation hardware coming out now. Um, and I personally believe that we've seen this development. It used to be the mainframe computers. It, it started to become personal computers in the 80s. And now it's about your smartphone and laptops connecting to the internet and the cloud. And the next logical step in computing is VR and, and AR and we're going to be much closer to, to uh, virtual objects than we have ever been before. Um, so my final slides, I, I definitely believe that uh, development has been demo democratized quite a lot. Uh, it's never been easier to change the world than it is today. All you, know is, all you need is internet, uh, computer, and know-how. Uh, to, and you can reach uh, a global audience. And it all goes back to the, the same reason why I, I got into games uh, in the beginning from the 80s. If it's already this cool today, just imagine what it will be like in a couple of years from now.
Thank you. Any questions? Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Palm. How are you? Um, thank you for that. Um, I was going to ask a question because you, you talked a lot about uh, the technology and a little bit about what's coming from Google and stuff. What, um, in terms of the, the global kind of markets, we've been doing quite a lot of work in, in China recently. Where, where do you see uh, the biggest kind of VR hit being? Because it feels to me right now Asia's a, a long way ahead in terms of actual units in the market. And I imagine with Daydream that will only continue. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, from what we see from the data that we get from the, the bait, the fishing game we did, we see currently a lot of interest from like US and traditional uh, Western markets. But that's because th that's where those uh, headsets are being pushed a lot and where, where we're seeing a lot of news. I, long term, I definitely think uh, Asia is a super interesting region for, for, uh, for VR and, and uh, maybe China especially. Uh, I think since it's competing with, with the console time and, and the TV time, in, in Sweden at least, where I'm familiar to, then there is a lot of uh, competition. Where in, in India and China and Brazil, uh, that's still a very, very exciting market that has a lot of growth potential.